Hello, how are you? I hope you're having a good weekend. I've had a nice quiet Sunday morning doing some reading, and I thought I'd make a casual video today looking at a different kind of best books of the year lists. You know how I love looking at these lists, and these uh, these are a few different lists um, chosen by authors of some of their favorite books from the year. And I th always seemed it really interesting to look at these, because partly just because I'm nosy, and I like to see what authors have been reading, but also I think it's really interesting interesting to consider how these books might influence these authors and their future writing, you know, even if they don't have a direct influence on them. I think it's interesting to think about how these are the kinds of authors and writing that they like to read and, and uh, so how they might respond to it. And also, slightly negatively, one of these author uh, picks uh, I've had a really negative reaction to, and I think it might mean that I don't read this author anymore. So uh, it, you know, could have a different kind of effect reading uh, some of these author picks. So uh, today, just today, uh, the the Guardian posted a, a list of authors um, picks. So I'm going to go through these first, and then look at some other lists. So at the very top, there is Douglas Stewart, uh, winner. Of of this year's Booker Prize, who says, who picks Elaine Freeney's uh, As You Were, uh, which I've not read and not really heard about before. And he says, it's a revelation with regards to the secret shames and everyday pain that women keep hidden. It is bursting with wonderful moments of unguarded intimacy between three Irish women who are stuck at a hospital ward together. A funny, sad, and absolutely irrepressible all at the same time. Uh, then he also recommends The Lamplighter by Jackie Kay, uh, which is a play I, I uh, talked about in a book haul video earlier this year, um, which I've not read yet, but um, yeah, sounds really interesting. Uh, he says, it's a heartbreaking portrait of four enslaved women. It's a beautiful work that you will feel deeply, but will also help the reader reconsider Britain's hidden history in the slave trade. And he also picks Who They Was by Gabriel Cross, which was long listed for this year's Booker Prize. So I always find it super interesting when Booker Prize nominated authors, uh, you know, are reading each other's work um, that, that they've sort of, you know, it's like, sort of in competition with, but not really. I mean, it's, you know, more just about talking about the books, right? Right? <laughs> uh, so he says about this book, it's a wild, wild ride from the very first page, an astonishing telling of a young man's search for belonging, caught between a life of crime with his London gain and hopes for his academic future. And I've not read this yet, um, though some people have commented that it's better listening to the audiobook of it, where you can hear uh, sort of the, the um, because of it I think is written in this kind of slang and so that sort of helps you sort of familiarize you with the language. Anyway going on next to Ali Smith uh, whose wonderful novel Summer came out um, earlier this year and uh, she says uh, Margaret Atwood has always been a poet. Her poetry collections make visible the taproot of the wry wise metaphysic that runs through her fiction and essays and in a precarious time her new collection Dearly is a source of uncompromising elemental warmth. Uh, I'd really like to, to read that poetry collection. Um, there was an anthology I showed recently um, that Joyce Carol Oates edited called Cutting Edge, and uh, Margaret Atwood had some poems in that as well. Um, she also recommends uh, David Diop's All Night, All Blood is Black, um, which I talked about really recently in a book haul video. Um, she says a novel translated from the French by Anna Mashavokis uh, deals with a very untold story. The Senegalese soldiers who fought for France in the First World War trenches and is so incantatory and visceral I don't think I'll ever forget it. And right now, I'm in the middle of Red Comet by Heather Clark, uh, surely the final definitive biography of Sylvia Plath, a book whose 1,000 plus page breadth on the one hand is lit so literally weighty that reading it means you have to develop new muscles, uh, and on the other hand, takes its time in desensitize, desensitize, de de this is hard to say, de 
sensationalizing the life and the art. Uh, this lets Clark place both firmly in the literary and politically engaged contexts that formed them, and simultaneously demonstrates how Plath's work in return gifted the writing life unimaginable new sinew. Uh, I'd really love to read that. Of course, that's a massive new biography about Sylvia Plath. And uh, yeah, so I know that'll take a lot of time, but um, I'm sure it will be really fascinating read. Then Carlo Rovelli, um, who's a nonfiction writer uh, that writes about the natural world, I think, and I've never read him before, but I've always been keen to. Um, he's a physicist as well as an author. And uh, he says that most of what I read this year was published in the past, quite often in the far past. I love reading classics, both in literature and among other books of ideas. But The End of Everything uh, by Katie Mack is one new book that stood out for me this year. When we think about our own life, we commonly worry about the end than the beginning. For the whole universe instead, we mostly hear inquiries about its beginnings. What about its end? How will the universe end up? We are not sure about the answer, of course, but there are a number of concrete possibilities that science is currently exploring. Katie Mack gives us an overview. She is a great scientist, a passionate inquirer of nature, a great companion in this exploration full of wit and lightness. I've learned from her plenty of things I did not know, and I found myself staring out the window, meditating about the end of it all. And I think that sounds so fascinating because I do love reading about outer space and, you know, the sort of science and nature of outer space and all the sort of competing theories uh, about that. And uh, yeah, so I think that would be really fascinating. And it's another reason why I love looking at these lists, of especially getting nonfiction picks, since I don't often read all that much nonfiction. But then Terry Jones, um, she picks uh, the Office of Historical Corrections. Danielle Evans reminds me why I love short fiction. I've not heard of this book before. Uh, these stories offer the the lose yourself depth of a novel in intense digestible portions. Evans is blessed with perfect pitch when it comes to dialogue, both in terms of what is spoken and what goes unsaid. Then there's The the First Woman by Jennifer Natsambuga McCumby, uh, which I believe is published with another title in the USA, but this is a novel I really want to get to. Um, she calls it the feminist coming of age story we've been waiting for, with the timeless quality of a story shared from lips to ears. This novel is a page turner and a mind blower. As for Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, could there possibly be a better time to read a novel about a plague? This is not an easy read, but 2020 hasn't been an easy year. As always, O'Farrell is challenging, compassionate, and very, very smart. And then there is Olivia Lane, uh, who um, published a collection of essays this year called Funny Weather, uh, Art in an Emergency, which I haven't read yet, uh, but I love her writing. Uh, she writes that in lieu of galleries, I've been binging on exhibition catalogs, and Michael Clark, Cosmic Dancer from the Barbican, is a peach. It reminds me of everything we're missing, bodies in close proximity, nightlife, dressing up, exuberance, and joy. I also love Philip Guston, now the catalogue for the controversial, controversially postponed retrospective that was supposed to open at the Tate next spring. Guston refused to turn a blind eye to white supremacy, and it's appalling that his clan paintings have been deemed unsuitable. Wow, I didn't know about this controversy. Uh, the best essay is by Michael Godfrey, the curator suspended for protesting against the decision. That's uh, There's more brilliant writing in Suppose a Sentence by Brian Dillon. Uh, that, he's a writer I've always meant to read. Um, she calls it a book about beguiling sentences from Shakespeare and Thomas Brown to Virginia Woolf and Anne Carson. Dillon's erudition and enthusiasm is so infectious that you want to read everything he describes, making this the perfect book to kick off a long lockdown winter. Uh, so some great endorsements there. And then Emma Donahue, uh, whose novel The Pull of the Stars came out earlier this year and that I still want to read. <laughs> These lists reminds me that I still have so many books that I didn't want to read before the end of the year. 
Um, she writes, smart and satirical about everything from the gig economy to racism in publishing to the inner politics of families, Raven Leilani's luster out in the UK in January about a young black woman in an unsettling relationship with a married white guy rings so true and her prose has a stylish verve. I bristled at the sight of Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet. I usually avoid novels about historical figures and their families, but 50 pages in, I was weeping for the young Hamnet Shakespeare and didn't care who his father was. An exquisite, sensorily alive study of childhood and parenthood in the Tudor age or any age, this richly deserved its woman's prize for fiction. Um, so yeah, really fascinating to hear her um, compliment and talk about another book that's sort of about a plague situation situation when her own novel is about a plague situation. Um, she also recommends Roddy Doyle's plainly titled Love. Uh, drew me in gently and moved me deeply as his old friends open up to each other over one pub crawl. Uh, on this side of the pandemic, I read it as a hymn to the small but irreplaceable pleasures of face-to-face -face chat in public places. Then there is Lionel Shriver, um, who says that once more, Lawrence Osborne did not disappoint in this atmospheric thriller, The Glass Kingdom, set in Bangkok for Western expats in exotic climes. The lesson of his collected work seems to read, for pity's sake, go home. Published perhaps unwisely under the pseudonym Temple Drake, the accomplished Rupert Thompson has nothing to apologize for NVK crosses the horror and thriller genre to original effect Thompson's sharply portrayed and predominantly Asian cast in Saigon argues well against any cultural appropriation taboo writers own whatever they can grasp and describe with skill uh, I didn't know about that I really enjoyed a novel Rupert Thompson wrote before so I didn't know that he also wrote under a pseudonym so that's that's really interesting to hear. Um, she also writes, and I confess for slightly lighter fare, I was also engaged by The Weekend by Charlotte Wood. If nothing else, it was refreshing to encounter a novel that so profoundly sympathizes with women on the forbidding cusp of being classified as elderly. Wood ably conveys the, that older women didn't used to be old and that the experience of aging is universally bewildering. Um, that's another novel I've been really wanting to get to and I've been wanting to read more of Charlotte Wood's um, work. Then there is Sarah Moss, um, whose Summer Water I've still not read as well. Um, she writes, uh, much needed cause for celebration, Kathleen Jamie's new essay collection, Surfacing, which lived at my bedside for rereading for months. She has the rare ability to see harm done to the natural world and to small communities and still to write with wonder as well as precision and to write better landscapes than anyone else. I read Kawhi Strawn Washburn's Sharks in the Time of Survivors in the first lockdown and was glad to be both transported to Hawaii and invited to think properly about tra tradition and ambition. It's about siblings growing up poor and clever, pulled both by the legends and skills of the pre-industrial past and by their longing for success in contemporary America. Uh, that sounds really good. I've not sort of come across that before, I don't think. Uh, the writing is so good, I forget my usual resistance to elements of fantasy. And she also recommends, uh, I loved Jenny Offal's Weather, um, which I also really loved, and Lily King's Writers and Lovers, both darkly funny and clever novels about women surviving Trump's America. There's a new genre forming there. Then uh, Daisy Johnson um, recommends uh, Little Eyes by Samantha Schweblin, translated by Megan McDowell, is a chilling and often hilarious book on the pitfalls of living in a highly interconnected world, Schweblin has a true talent for getting to the center of our fears and drawing them out. I wasn't as impressed by this novel, but it is really enjoyable and I thought it was quite interesting. Um, she also recommends I'm Not Your Baby Mother by Candace Braithwaite is an enormously important book about mother and the systematic racism inherent in the UK when it comes to pregnancy, birth, and raising children. Compellingly written, it's alive with a fury it is impossible not to feel when reading. I think I talked about that book in an earlier list of uh, best books of the year. So yeah, that um, sounds really interesting. She also recommends Tiffany McDaniel's Betty is a brilliant, expansive exploration of family and grief, an innovative coming-of-age story filled with with magic in language and plot. 
It is beautiful and devastating. McDaniel continues to be someone to watch. And that is the novel I'm reading right now and that I was reading this morning. So, um, so yeah, I'm uh, really enjoying it, um, though, yeah, there's some quite difficult things in it. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm really eager to, to finish it and, and read more of it. Um, I'll be reading more after I get this before I go out and do some Christmas shopping. Then there is Natalie Haynes. Um, she recommends Sandy Barch. New translation of Vigil's The Aeneid is terrific and a gorgeous physical book too, fresh and pacey. Brecht uh, walks the tightrope between maintaining the grandeur of the original and making the poem accessible to reader, modern readers and makes it look easy. The Aeneid is the great refugee narrative of its own time, and it should be for our time too. I'm obsessed with Thebes, the home of Cadmus, Oedipus, and Antigone. Uh, Antigone. It's Antigone, right? Not Antigone. Sorry. Uh, so Paul Cartledge's Thebes, the Forgotten City of Ancient Greece, is exactly the book for me. Academic books are often a bit dry, but this study of the city, its myth and its history, is anything but dusty. Religion, war, and myth are all interrogated with equal rigor. Don't tell me Thomas Cromwell wasn't as beautiful and nuanced as Hilary Mantel makes him in The Mirror and the Light. I don't want to know. I want to maintain the fantasy. As a sustained act of world building, time travel, and mind reading, I'm not sure her Cromwell trilogy will ever be equaled. At the beginning of the first lockdown, it was honestly more consoling than food. <laughs> that is such a great description of Hilary Mantel's book. There's David Lammy um, who recommends some non fiction. Uh, when it comes to literature on racism in the US, the market feels pretty saturated. At least that's what I thought before I read Isabel Wilk Wilkerson's cast, The Lies That Divide Us. It is an extraordinarily authentic expose that uncovers how discrimination, domination, and dehumanization is paralyzingly normalized, violently exercised, and psychologically ingrained. And yeah, I just read this book uh, recently after seeing it on a number of these best book lists, and I completely agree and talked about it in my last wrap-up um, video, but he describes it much more eloquently than I did. Uh, then uh, he also recommends Lionel Barber, offers a scathing yet humorous portrait of power in the powerful and the damned. The most surprising revelation among his diary entries was the level of disenchantment he expressly holds for our decaying economic system and democracy. And Patrick Vernon and Angelina Osborne's 100 Great Black Britons is an empowering read. For many in Britain, people of African and Caribbean descent in this country have been reduced to three words, the Windrush scandal. It's refreshing then to see somebody celebrate the role that Black Britons have played in this island's long and complicated history. So yeah, that sounds really fascinating too. Then there's Jonathan Coe, uh, who has a novel out called Mr. Wilder and Me. Um, that was in another Best Books video that I talked about and that I've been wanting to read. He writes that two of the novels I enjoyed most this year pushed hard at generic boundaries, walking a giddy line between realism on the one hand and fantasy or the uncanny on the other. In her debut novel, Love and Other Thought Experiments, Sophie Ward paints a tender and compelling portrait of an ordinary relationship, then uh, pushes the story in increasingly quirky directions. The result is a challenging, intellectually provocative, but strangely moving novel. And I so agree about that. You know, it was uh, one of the books I was most excited about to see on the Booker Prize long list this year, since it was one of my favorite books that I've read this year. And I did a whole interview with Sophie Ward, which I'll link below in case you didn't see it and are interested in, in watching that. Um, he also recommends M. John Harrison's deservedly won the Goldsmiths Prize for the second land begins to rise again, his eerie but deadly accurate portrait of modern Britain, written in seamless accomplished prose, the prose of a master, and with the Severn River as one of its central characters. A more conventional but very enjoyable novel was Joanna Briscoe's The Seduction, a typically probing, sometimes uncomfortable, always gripping study of erotic obsession, Briscoe's speciality from one of our most underrated authors. Yi Yun Lee recommends, uh, the books I most enjoyed this year were A Saint from Texas by Edmund White, a novel I also absolutely loved and that I've been recommending a lot. How Much of These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Jane, the Booker Lom listed book that I've 
been wanting to get to and read, uh, and Cleanness by Garth Greenwell, another novel, um, his his uh, second novel that I've been wanting to read. Uh, they are writers at different stages of their careers, but the books share a vigor that I admire. Life Stories of Twin Sisters from Texas, a retelling of American West from the angle of Chinese immigrants, and a young man's making and remaking of himself. These novels, not hankering after being books of this particular time, offer readers the beauty of language, the intricacies and intensity of human emotions, and a sense of timelessness. They each make a vast world in which the imagination soars. And uh, I'll just do a few more. I'm sort of skipping through some some, you know, the authors that I'm most interested in. So Anne N. Wright um, says that poet Doreen Ne Gifor, Gifa, sorry, it's an Irish name. I really struggle with that name. Um, she writes, uh, is getting all the love this year from readers in Ireland. She has put her entire self into A Ghost in the Throat, a book of nonfiction in which she describes what it is to be alive at this time in this body and in the thrall to a poem that was written by another woman in 1773. I talked about this book in a book haul video a number of months ago and I've sp still been really wanting to get to it. It's one of the books I most want to get to in December. Uh, she also writes, believe me, much easier to read than to describe. The Art of the Glimpse, edited by Sinead Gleeson, is a substantial volume, a lucky dip of Irish short stories that give the canon a terrific shake. Uh, and yeah, I've been really wanting to get a copy of this collection because I've I love Sinead Gleeson's uh, memoir sort of or book of uh, memoirist essays and uh, and also collections of short stories that Sinead Gleeson has edited in the past. So yeah, I really want to get a copy of this. Um, she also recommends Mark O'Connell, uh, who wrote the first good thing I read after the pandemic hit. It was just a short newspaper column, but it cut through the dread, and I was so drawn by it, I picked up his Notes from an Apocalypse, which manages the same trick. It should be depressing, but isn't. O'Connell has a rare ability to be blokish and woke, funny and frightened and sound. This is a profoundly intelligent book. Um, so yeah, that's that's a book I've been really wanting to, to read as well. So a few more. There's Rachel Joyce, um, who published a novel called Miss uh, Benson's Beetle, um, that I've been meaning to read uh, this year. She recommends The Wild Silence by Rainer Wynne, uh, takes up where the salt path finished and deals not only with the aftermath of that life-changing experience of nature, but also the influences that led to it in the first place. Written in wise, unflinching, exquisite prose, this is a different kind of journey into the past, into grief, and also into Wynne's search for a connection, a spiritual journey instead of a physical one, and for me at least, an even richer one. A new novel by Donald Ryan is always something to be excited about, and Strange Flowers is no exception. This is a sublime book, breathtaking in its scope and lyricism about loss, identity, and the power of love. I've been so meaning to read that. I'm such a huge fan of his work, and that's another book that's high on my priorities of what I want to read in December. Um, she also recommends Love After Love by Ingrid Perceau, is a vibrant, brave novel about an unconventional family unit in Trinidad. Uh, I absolutely agree. I love this novel so much, and obviously, uh, you know, I was one of the judges that put it on the Costa Book Awards first novel category this year um, list. So yeah, I'm so um, happy more people are talking about love after love. Uh, and she also recommends And My Wild and Sleepless Nights by Clover Stroud is a robust, raw, and rare celebration of motherhood that had me laughing out loud one moment and crying the next. And uh, yeah, I've not heard of that, so that sounds quite interesting. But I felt the same way about Ingrid Persaud's book, that I was laughing out loud quite often, but then crying the next moment. Then there is Maza Mengiste, who recommends Paul Mendez's unflinching, revelatory novel, Rainbow Milk, is a story about outsiders, about faith and sexual identity, but it's also about those unexpected places where tenderness still exists. And I absolutely agree. I loved Rainbow Milk so much. And, you know, I was hoping it would be on the Booker Prize list this year, but sadly not. 
Uh, she also recommends Claire Massoud's essays in Kant's Little Prussian Head and Other Reasons Why I Write, our generous visions of the world informed by her razor-sharp intellect and uncompromising honesty. Each moment she extends to us feels like a jewel, prismatic and brilliant. Um, I just talked about this book recently in a book haul video. It's such a beautiful looking book too, like its cover. Um, so yeah, I'd really like to get to that as well. And she also recommends every photographer involved in Africa African Cosmologies, Photography Time and the Other, curated by Mark Seeley, offers a radical vision of what it means to reclaim the camera's powers for themselves, featuring some of the most acclaimed talents across the African continent and the diaspora. This book showcases visually stunning acts of reclamation and rebellion. Oh, there's also recommendations from Avni Doshi, so I want to uh, talk about those as well. So she recommends Hurricane Season is a sprawling and heaving thing and I loved it because I have no idea how Fernanda Melchor was able to write it. The prose quality has the quality of a storm. Uh, each chapter follows a different character drawing links between disparate events, expanding the chain of violence. And I yeah, totally agree with that summary. Um, you know, that was the International Booker Prize uh, nominated book that I was hoping would win this year. And I thought it was so wonderful. And yeah, one of my favorite books of the year. Um, it's really extraordinary. I had been waiting for years for Jenny Offel's next novel and I wasn't disappointed. Uh, as usual, she pinpoints a series of emotions and ideas before I know I'm feeling them or have the words to artic articulate them. In weather, she creates a looming sense of dread, one that invades the otherwise normal lives of her characters. And yeah, totally agree. I love that novel. And uh, then she recommends in Blue Ticket, Sophie McIntosh poses a question. What if po procreating isn't a choice? The question reverberates from the political into the existential, a sensation that rings true for me personally. While pregnant, I raced through this beautiful and menacing novel over the course of a day, and I was haunted by it for weeks after. Um, I've been really meaning to read that because I loved Sophie McIntosh's first novel. And yeah, it's so interesting how she describes it there. So I wonder if that's sort of that that subject matter is going to sort of influence um, her next writing or, or her next book or what she produces next. But um, but yeah, I absolutely loved Avni Dashi's novel. So I really hope she she does uh, write another novel and publish uh, another novel. So those are the, the authors I'm going to talk about from that list. Then I'm going to go on to a list from the Irish Times that they also published this weekend of the best books of 2020 as chosen by Irish authors. And you know I love Irish writers. So um, I was really curious about this. And uh, so first off, there's Mark O'Connell, who Anne Enright uh, recommended his nonfiction book. And he says, uh, my favorite new nonfiction book this year was Ed Caesar's The Moth and the Mountain. It's a wild story about a veteran of the First World War named Maurice Wilson, who, despite never having climbed anything more demanding than a flight of stairs, decided that he was going to fly solo to Everest and climb the mountain alone. Uh, this was 1934, almost two decades before Tenzin Norgay and Edmund Hillary finally cracked it, and so obviously he didn't succeed. He died halfway up. But the story of his failure is far more interesting to this reader, at least, than that of uh, any mere success would have been. Caesar is a masterful storyteller, and he imbues this narrative of doomed adventurism with real compassion and intrigue. I've not heard of this uh, book before, so yeah, that sounds so fascinating and uh, yeah, I like a story I'd really like to read. Uh, he also recommends, I didn't read an awful lot of new fiction this year, but the novel that seems to have stayed with me is Earthlings uh, by the Japanese writer Sayaka Murata. It has an, a similar affectless eeriness to her previous novel, The Wildly Successful and Brilliant Convenience Store Woman, but where that book was all uncanny, uncanny control, this one is pure, demented abandon. It's not the darkness of the events Murata describes that is most disturbing, but the blank chirpiness of the narrative voice with which her narrator uh, relates them. There were times I couldn't decide whether I hated it or whether it was genius, but either way, I couldn't stop reading it. And yeah, that's such a great summary of Earthlings because yeah, I I had this sort of slightly f similar conflicted feeling about it too. But yeah, the way he highlights the narrative voice in, in that way, yeah, I think is um, yeah really spot on. Then Danny 
Danielle McLaughlin, uh, who who uh, whose debut novel is coming out next year. And, you know, I loved her short story collection, Dinosaurs on Other Planets. Um, so her debut novel is one of my most anticipated books of next year. So she writes, um, Actress by Anne Enright is a brilliant, lyrical, powerful novel centered around a mother-daughter relationship and the world of theater. It's dazzlingly sharp and unnervingly intimate. Another standout was The Last Day at Bowen's Court by Eber Walsh. Set during wartime London, North Cork, and Dublin, this reimagining of Elizabeth Bowen's love affair with the Canadian diplomat Charles Ritchie is richly textured and compelling. I stayed up until the small hours finishing Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reid. It begins with a young black woman being falsely accused of kidnapping the white child she's babysitting. It's a smart, funny book that, as well as being a page turner, explores complex dynamics of race and class. I absolutely agree with that. Um, yeah, I loved that novel. Uh, I loved Kathy McSweeney's short story collection, Modern Times, an entertaining and magnificently weird book that buzzes with originality. Um, I talked about this book recently in one of the uh, yeah lists of best books of the year because um, yeah I've read some stories from that and it's uh, they're so yeah wild and weird and uh, absurd and really fascinating. Um, she also recommends and staying with short stories The Art of the Glimpse edited by Sinead Gleason is a triumph a gloriously varied rewriting of the canon of the Irish short story so yeah I definitely need to get a copy of that book. Uh, so okay next up is John Banville. So now he's a writer I've really enjoyed reading in the past. I've read a few of his novels. I think his writing is so beautiful and fascinating. And But he writes here, uh, Martin Amis has always been a risk taker and he takes some whopping ones in Inside Story, this autobiographical novel, funny, tender, and captivatingly intelligent, concentrates on three of the author's lost loves, Saul Bellow, Christopher Hitchens, and the succubus who haunted his life, the ineffable creature he calls Phoebe Phelps. Now, I'm not interested in reading Martin Amis, and I, I just... I'm, the, his writing in the past I've read, I haven't really cared for. Um, so, you know, it, and it's fine if, you know, other people enjoy his writing and want to read him and recommend him. But this next statement he makes, he writes, if anyone can bring readers back to the serious novel, it is Amos. And that statement, I feel like, is f filled with so much because, I mean, he's basically dissing a, a lot of other modern literature and saying like, well, Martin Amos is doing it right. You know, he's writing serious novels. And what does he mean by serious novels? What what does that even mean? Uh, I think that is such a like loaded statement to, to make and uh, really pretentious and and really dismissive. And it, it makes me really angry reading that. And, you know, it makes me feel like I I don't want to read John Banville anymore if that's the kind of attitude he has. I mean, it's a very old manish sort of attitude to take, a very dismissive look. And, you know, I'm getting to be an old man myself. I'm not saying all old men are like that and have that attitude, but I think there's definitely that certain attitude, um, which is very snobbish and dismissive uh, about modern literature. And, and uh, yeah, it makes me really upset. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I want to read him anymore. You know, he might be a great writer, but there's lots of new books out there and uh, I might just uh, choose not to read him anymore. He has a new novel out called Snow, which is a sort of, I think, thriller detective novel. And I talked about it in a book haul video and about how I wasn't sure if I wanted to read it. But I think this made up my mind. I I think I'm going to you know put that book aside and like give it to a charity shop or uh, yeah, put it away. So yeah, that's, that's my sort of feeling about that. I, I think that's really awful that, that he wrote that. And, you know, and Martin Amos has had a similar attitude in interviews that he's given recently, like being very dismissive uh, about both the Booker Prize and, um, yeah, modern literature being published. And yeah, so, um, so uh, that's, um, I think I'm going to end there. There's another of 
other like really great authors um, recommendations of Irish authors giving recommendations in this list I'd really encourage you to look at it I'll put links in the description below both to this list and the the Guardian list of, of books um, you know it's well worth having a look through but I just thought I'd talk through some of these choices and uh, my reactions to them and yeah my quite extreme reaction to uh, John Banville's um, statement there uh, which I think is really awful but I'd like to know your opinions on any of these books or um, yeah thoughts about them or if uh, you're curious to read any of these books um, now that these authors have recommended them or if you have any opinions about this whole John Banville thing and you know this question of what makes a serious book or serious literature uh, yeah so um, but anyway hope you have a good weekend and uh, yeah find some good things to read get some reading time and uh, yeah like I said I'm gonna go do some Christmas shopping but uh, plan to hopefully get back soon and uh, and do some more reading so I'll speak to you again soon thanks for watching Bye for now.